First, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the topics that I study, and I kind of cover that in what I call the molecular trail of life. Um, I'm a chemist by training. I like to study molecules and how they react, and I specifically put that in the context of um, astrobiology and the formation of life. Now, as Timia already said, um, I actually visited in 2018 in Bordeaux, and uh, I talked there about more the astrochemistry side of things that, uh, that I study. So the formation of formamide and um, uh, metal cyanide, uh, or isocyanide, I must say. Uh, but this talk will not really be about that. But feel free to get in touch with me uh, to hear more about more recent developments about this work. But this topic will be more about planetary science and astrobiology. Now, before I dive into the details, um, I want to give a quick overview of what this talk is really about. Uh, it is about finding life and specifically the instruments that we use to do that. And with these instruments, we detect the chemical tracers of life. Now, the context for this talk is Mars, which is, of course, because of the recent Perseverance Mars rover landing. So it's a really nice and current topic to talk about. Now, before I start talking about Mars, I do want to give a little bit of um, history and context. I'm located in Bern, which besides uh, being a very pretty looking city, also hosts a very well-known uh, planetary science institute, which has been involved in very many uh, space instruments all the way going back to the Apollo mission that landed on the moon, where there was a Swiss-based experiment um, that was meant to collect solar wind particles, which you are seeing here being deployed. Now, some more recent instruments that the department has worked on um, are uh, this one that you probably know, the, an instrument for the Rosetta mission, a uh, mass spectrometer, which uh, sniffs up the coma gases and uh, analyzes those. Uh, but we also worked on instruments for the Bepi Colombo mission, which is currently on its way to Mercury. It recently passed Venus. And for example, uh, the, the CHAOPS instrument or the CHAOPS uh, yeah, flight uh, instrument was actually constructed here, which is <clears throat> detecting the transits of exoplanets. And that recently started delivering its first results. All right, now let's talk about life on Mars. And I right away want to focus on the challenges for life on Mars. Uh, if we simplify what life needs, then there are basically three components. Those are nutrients, energy, and water. And this is, of course, for life as we know it. All our studies are focusing on life as we know it because it is the only template that we have. There might be forms of life out there somewhere that function in a completely different way, but we simply have no way of knowing how that would look like. So we focus on what we know. Now, in the context of Mars, when we're talking about nutrients for any kind of organism, the situation is quite okay. We know now that there are various uh, organic molecules present in the surface of Mars. Uh, there's plenty of minerals available. So all kinds of materials that an organism can use to, um, yeah, to basically keep running. But then we switch to energy, and that's where the problems start occurring. Because Mars gets its fair share of uh, photon energy, uh, which it could use uh, in organisms, for example, for photosynthesis, but it gets a very high dose of um, energy. So for example, if we look at the ionizing radiation levels, which you see here in these nice global maps, uh, then you see very high dosages. Now, these dosages, dosages might not say a lot, but they are at the very least 10 times higher than what we experience on Earth. In many cases, actually a factor of 100 uh, times higher. And that basically means that all this ionizing radiation is, of course, very damaging for any kind of life form that's present. Now, besides the ionizing radiation, Mars uh, in its history lost most of its atmosphere as well. So uh, it has a very thin atmosphere, which actually doesn't protect the surface that well from harsh UV photons, which are also damaging to life. Now, the last point is water. And as we know, water is uh, not readily available on Mars. Mars is actually a quite dark, dry place, but it actually has, um, it used to have 
bodies of water on its surface, as we can see from surface evidence, which you see here on this picture from the ASA Mars Express, which shows a dried up river system. So yes, Mars used to have a lot of liquid surface water, but most of it is nowadays lost. Um, it literally got eroded off the planet. Um, and what remains is frozen or maybe in subsurface lakes. And that basically results in the following conclusion, that the conditions on Mars are not really that great for life um, in its current form. And that basically means that the types of evidence for life that we look for are those that are probably subsurface microbial life or life that has long gone extinct. Now, and in this context, it is important to mention that in terms of size, we're looking for something that is probably very small. We're talking bacteria and microbes um, and probably something that is a micrometer in size. This will become important later on. But still, we give it a shot and we are gonna look for life out on Mars. Uh, we've been doing that in many different uh, land missions already. And the latest installment of that is the landing of the Perseverance rover, which you see here hanging from the sky crane, which gently puts it down on the surface. Now, if we go looking for life, we do of course look for a location that is promising to have had life or might still have life. And one of those locations are these old river deltas. And this is actually a picture of the landing region of Perseverance. And what you can see here is this beautiful river delta. And this is what Perseverance is going to study. Now, there's of course a very good reason for studying this specific uh, um, location. There used to be water, so maybe that is um, enough reason for life to have been there, or the water that was there has now moved into the subsurface and there are still some microbes uh, running around in the bottom there. Now, when we have landed and we are driving around, we look for biosignatures. And this picture gives a very nice overview of the types of biosignatures that you can find on Mars. I'm not gonna cover them all, but I do wanna highlight the two main categories that basically are there. On the one hand, we look for fissional signatures. And here you need to think of um, evidence that is placed in the mineralogical record um, that there was life. Or for example, think about uh, coral reefs, which are not per se biological material, but they are clear evidence that some biological activity was taking place there. Now, once we identify such visual signatures, then you would look for chemical indicators of life. And these can be biomolecules or elements or certain isotope ratios that indicate a living organism. Now, it's this latter category that I will focus my talk on and also um, a lot of the work with Perseverance focuses on. So what we look for is really biogenic elements, isotope ratios and biomolecules that are present in the rocks, in the soil or in icy material or anything in between. So still talking about Perseverance, here we see an uh, overview of the instrument that Perseverance um, has. And uh, I've highlighted three instruments that are specifically meant to look for those chemical biosignatures. Now, I wanna quickly give you a flavor of what these instruments can do and also some of the challenges that they have. So one of the instruments on Perseverance is called SuperCam, which is so-called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy instrument. And what it does is actually quite simple. You take a high-powered laser, you shoot that at a rock, and you completely evaporate the rock. Now, after that, you have highly excited um, atoms, which of course emit light. And then you take a spectrograph to pick up that light and from the colors, um, that the elements emit, you can basically determine the composition of the rock. You can also use this, of course, to identify uh, biological elements and in that way find life. Now, one of the main benefits of this technique is that it can do remote sensing. You can shoot your laser up to a couple of meters away and um, basically investigate rocks that are not right next to your rover. Uh, but there are also some downsides. One of them is that it's spatially quite inaccurate. For example, the laser spot 
is about 100 micrometer. So besides pointing issues, if you are thinking along the lines of um, wanting to analyze a micro uh, organism, which is one micrometer or two micrometer in size, and you cover a spot of 100 micrometer, you not only get the chemical information of this one organism, but all the surrounding material as well. And that basically can dilute your signal a lot. And that, of course, presents a problem because maybe you miss, uh, because of that reason, um, the biological signature. A more big issue is the low sensitivity because the plasma, the, the light that is emitted from this spot is of course emitting in 360 degrees in a full sphere um, all around and your spectrograph is only picking up a small section of that. So inherently, this technique has a low sensitivity. Now, this is an example that I give for just one instrument, but actually a lot of spectroscopic uh, techniques deal with similar disadvantages. And the same for UV spectroscopy or X-ray spectroscopy. It's spatially relatively inaccurate and it has relatively low sensitivity. Now, another type of instrument that has a very long and rich history in uh, planetary science investigations and the search for life that I want to talk about is the so-called pyrolysis gas chromatography mass spectrometer. Now, this instrument is not included on Perseverance, um, but there has been multiple rovers and landers, uh, such as the Viking mission, the earliest lander on, uh, on Mars, uh, which have carried this instrument. Now, I don't want to go too much into the details of this instrument, but the main thing that I want to point out is that it says the word gas here. To analyze molecules with this instrument, uh, the molecules need to be in the gas phase. And that is somewhat of a problem when most of your biomolecules, such as an amino acid like glycine here, are basically solid at any kind of reasonable temperature below 200 degrees Celsius. So you need to get them into gas phase somehow, and that's where the word pyrolysis comes into play, which basically means as much as we take a soil sample and we put it in an oven and we ramp up that oven to uh, two, three, four hundred degrees Celsius, and then we evaporate everything, and then our mass spectrometer can detect the signature of a biomolecule. Now, this is something that has been done already multiple times on Mars, and in recent years, it's become very clear that there is a problem with that, and that problem comes from the soil of Mars. Uh, which, as you might know, contains a lot of perchlorates, which you see here on the left side, and also all kinds of other kind of salt. Now, when that is in your oven, you start forming very reactive compounds such as uh, oxygen radicals or hydrogen chloride, which is very strong acid. And if that gets in contact with organic material, it effectively starts burning it up and you only form CO2 and water. So we might have had the situation at this point that these instruments actually collected soil, which was very rich in all kinds of biosignatures and would have been a very clear indication that there was life on Mars at some point, but we simply didn't detect it because the signature got burned up and we only saw CO2 and water. So this chemical alteration is a very big issue uh, with certain space instruments. Now, and that's a nice segue to of course, get to the instruments that we are working on in Bern, because we realized we need a technique that has high sensitivity, high spatial resolution, and does not chemically alter samples. And at the same time, it also needs to follow a couple of rules that are important for space instruments, that it needs to be simple and low weight and low power consumption. Of course, it needs to survive a rocket launch and a couple of years in space, so that's important. So if we combine those parameters, the technique we ended up with is laser-based mass spectrometry, which covers two sub-techniques uh, called laser desorption ionization mass spectrometry and laser ablation ionization mass spectrometry. All right, so let me tell a little bit more about how these kind of techniques work and what they can do. Let me start with laser desorption. Uh, when we actually take a laser pulse, uh, which is relatively low power. And next we take a sample that um, is covered in biomolecules. Now we shoot our laser on this layer of biomolecules and the laser um, gently breaks the physicist bonds of the biomolecules to a certain surface. Now, 
the physics sort of bonds, they break, the molecules are released to the gas phase. And in the interaction with the laser pulse, they actually get gently ionized. So what we now get is biomolecules that are slowly released to the gas phase and ionized. The other option is a little bit harsher. That's laser ablation, where we take a much more uh, intense laser pulse. And we fire that as well on a surface, for example, a mineral. But instead of gently loosening up molecules, uh, like with laser desorption, here we actually completely destroy the surface and we completely atomize it. And we release the entire mineral in its elemental form to the gas phase and in the same time also ionize it. Now, the benefit of laser ablation is that you can do some really cool tricks with it, such as depth profiling. And this basically means we fire multiple laser shots at the surface and we layer by layer remove some of the mineral. And in that way, we can reach um, elemental signatures that are um, a couple of micrometers below the surface. So we now have two techniques um, that are suited on the one hand side for molecule analysis and on the other hand side for elemental analysis. But now we need to, of course, analyze our species. So once these molecules or elements are released to the gas phase and ionize, we put them in a so-called time of flight mass spectrometer, which is a relatively simple technique. You just take an electric field, the ion moves on the electric field and you move it towards the detector. And the amount of time that it takes to cover this flight path is uh, corresponding to a certain mass signature. So in this way, we can really weigh the composition of the molecules or the elements that we have just released from our sample. Now, this time of flight mass spectrometer is one of the core instruments that we have in Bern and that we have developed over the past uh, years. And that is a miniature time of flight mass spectrometer, which you see here on the left hand side. Now, this mass spectrometer is roughly the size of a Coca-Cola can. And of course, we need to make it this small to fit on a space mission. And with this core instrument, we are doing our investigations. And we do our investigations in two prototype setups, uh, which on the left-hand side is uh, the origin setup, which is meant for molecule detection. And on the right-hand side, the not so creatively named LMS setup, uh, which we use for elemental analysis. Now, you see here a lot of like laboratory equipment standing around, but let me walk you through it. Uh, both these setups work in roughly the same way, but let me highlight a little bit what is going on here based on origin. So first of all, we have a laser system, in this case, a relatively low power laser system to gently release the molecules. We have a whole bunch of optics to manipulate and guide the laser beam into the setup. Then we go to a vacuum chamber and this vacuum chamber, that is the place where we house our mass spectrometer. Now, our laser uh, beam goes coaxially through the mass spectrometer. There are holes on both sides, so we don't damage the mass spectrometer itself, of course. And then we focus the laser light on a sample holder. And on the sample holder, we can, of course, put uh, molecular samples, but also all kinds of minerals or any kind of rocky surface that we are interested in. So what I hope to highlight with this schematic is that the working of uh, laser mass spectrometry is, is very simple and we can make this very compact and, and lightweight, of course. Now to drive that point further home, what I show here is a laser system that is an, a general laboratory laser. But what we can of course do is replace this with microchip lasers, uh, which we are working on at the moment in, uh, in Bern. And you see here one of those microchip lasers uh, in a test bench. Um, and these are just a couple of centimeters in dimension. Now, with tools like that, we can put them into a, an actual instrument of which you see a design here. This is the CAMAM instrument, which was an instrument proposed for the Marco Polo R mission. Uh, it's a mission that was supposed to investigate near Earth asteroids, uh, but unfortunately did not get funded. But the main point of showing these designs is that you can here see that this instrument fits in a box that is roughly 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters. Now, 
Those of you who have a little bit of laboratory experience uh, will notice that this is, of course, significantly smaller than any kind of analysis device uh, that you generally find in an earth-based laboratory. So cool, we now know a little bit about the technique. Let's see um, how it performs. And I wanna start here with elemental analysis that we have done with the LMS instrument. So as you recall, we are looking for small traces of life, uh, microbes, and maybe this life has gone extinct. So it's present in fossilized form. So this is one of the things that we started testing with the LMS. And what you see here is uh, four pictures of locations on a so-called gunflint shirt, uh, which is a piece of mineral that comes from Canada and is known to host um, fossils, microfossils, actually. Now, as you might imagine, the black dots are the suspected microfossils. So what we do here is we place it in our LMS setup, we shoot a number of laser pulses at it, and we analyze the mass spectra of the elements coming out of these uh, analyzed spots. And that is what you see here for the four different spots. Now we can further analyze those mass spectra and for example, get the abundances, uh, which are here plotted for uh, various masses with respect to uh, silicium, mass 28. And the main thing, thing to note is that what we can see, for example, for mass 12, which is of course carbon, um, that the intensity of carbon is significantly higher at position D. So this is a clear indicator that there is something organic or well, extinct organic um, embedded in this, uh, in this piece of mineral. Now, of course, we combine that with multiple lines of evidence. So we look at other elements uh, that are also um, known to be associated with life, such as hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. And if you combine those uh, pieces of evidence, you can give a very strong chemical indication that this is indeed a fossil. Now, at my introduction, I made uh, already a quite big deal about this depth profiling technique. And that was uh, studied in well, this study, where we look at another type of fossil, um, this time embedded in a mineral called aragonite. And you see it indicated with the arrows here on the left-hand side. Now, what we can do is, of course, scrape off layer by layer um, the, uh, the minerals from the surface. And that's what you see here on this plot, where we show the, uh, the concentration of magnesium and calcium uh, with the depth into the sample. And here the depth is actually an arbitrary number. It does not correspond to a physical depth, I must say. Now, this is a position where we focus the laser on this fossil, and we see that we have a very high concentration of these elements initially, and that quite rapidly drops down to almost nothing. Now, what we can also do is position our laser next to a fossil and then look deeper into the sample. And if we do that, we see that the signal over depth actually start increasing. So we can find a subsurface signature of this microfossil. So subsurface analysis of biogenic elements is possible. Now you might be thinking, yeah, that's cool, but why is that relevant? It's actually very relevant because here we are still working in a laboratory with quite controlled conditions and quite controlled samples. But the problem on Mars will be that we will be working with rocky surfaces which have been processed by the Martian atmosphere, by radiation for millions of years. So if we would analyze the surface uh, of a Martian rock, the Mineral mineralogical composition is probably completely scrambled. So to get to the more pristine material, we actually need this depth profiling technique to drill into the rock and to find pristine biogenic signatures. Now, the other option that we have is to look for actually something that is alive. And that was done in this study by Stevens et al, um, where you, they took um, a bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, and put that in a Martian mudstone analog. Now, this Martian mudstone analog is basically a, a mixture of minerals that are thought to be present on Mars. Um, and you can just commercially buy that actually. And yeah, you mix there your bacteria in there. And again, you start analyzing it with LMS and again with the depth profiling technique 
to find maybe a signature of these microbes in there. So this sample here on the left-hand side was put into the LMS machine. And again, the depth um, analysis was performed, which you see here on the y-axis is again, the, the, or sorry, on the x-axis, of course, is the depth into the material. And then we see the intensity variations of various uh, elements. And what we see here with this very clear spike is actually an increase of carbon. And of course, higher we see various other elements that also start increasing. So this is very clear evidence that in this case, this bacteria was hit by the laser and we could retrieve a signature of this living organism. So to conclude the LMS work a little bit, um, basically what we can do with LMS is really detect elemental signatures uh, of extinct or existing organisms. And the tool that we have with depth profiling is very powerful to find these signatures in the subsurface. But now let's go have a look at molecules, which we analyze with origin. So when we're looking for molecules, we'll probably take them from, from um, soil samples um, or IC samples. And now we could put those in the machine and, and shoot a laser on the soil and, um, and basically analyze the molecules that are present there. But actually, this is not the most efficient way to analyze molecules. What we rather do is we extract the molecules in a liquid uh, from these samples. And then these liquids we put on a sample holder, shown here uh, again for the laboratory case. And we evaporate or sublimate the uh, liquid uh, content and we form uh, a concentrated organic film. And if we have like this or uh, concentrated organic film, it of course increases our chances of detecting biosignatures. Now we put that in the origin setup and then we can measure these beautiful mass spectra um, as shown here for the case of amino acids. Now these amino acids have a unique mass signature by which we can identify them. Uh, a question that I very often get is like, yeah, can you also do, um, for example, other biomolecules like uh, nucleobases or lipids or sugars? And the answer to that is definitely yes, um, but we simply haven't gotten around to that. So all the work that we have been doing up to now has been focused on amino acids and identifying them. Now, one thing that we are particularly proud of, of the origin instrument, is its sensitivity, which, as you can see in this plot, goes down to a couple of uh, femtomol per square millimeter uh, in a three sigma limit of detection. This might be a unit that is not very familiar uh, uh, to most of you, so let me put that a little bit in context and compare it with some other instruments, such as, for example, the MoMA instrument, the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, uh, which will be flying on the Rosalind Franklin rover. And this instrument also contains a laser desorption mass spectrometer. And the sensitivity of this instrument is rated at uh, just above uh, 1000 femtomol per square millimeter. Now, of course, there's also other groups um, working on similar laser uh, mass spectrometry techniques, and they generally list their sensitivity as just below 1000 femtomol per square millimeter. And that basically makes uh, yeah makes it visible that our uh, instrument can actually go two to three orders of magnitude lower in sensitivity in many cases, which is a really useful feature to have if you are looking for trace amounts of biomolecules. Now with this very high sensitivity, what we can do is the following. We can start looking and investigating a um, analog sample uh, such as a permafrost sample, which was uh, extracted from the uh, Russian uh, uh, Yaldoma region, uh, which is basically uh, yeah, permafrost material. And this material is thought to act as a uh, Martian polar material analog. Now we extracted the liquids from this uh, sample, from this uh, region, and we analyzed them with origin. And the main result that I can uh, yeah, tell about right now is that we first of all detect many signatures that belong to organic molecules. So we are capable of um, analyzing one of these samples and we could already an, uh, identify some of the mass signatures as belonging to certain specific amino acids. 
So yes, Origin can measure a quote unquote realistic sample. Now to get to the next uh, bit about Origin, I need to talk about a problem that we initially had, but this problem turns out to be quite a nice opportunity, actually. And this problem is the coffee stain problem. Because if we have a liquid uh, with uh, biomolecules in there, and that liquid is evaporating and forming an organic film, it of course does not form a homogeneous organic film. It forms the so-called coffee stain. And this is problematic if you want to know something about the um, concentration of your sample, because if you shoot your laser at this position, you might find a signal that is actually 10 times higher than your average concentration. Whereas if you shoot it here, you don't find anything at all. So the obvious maybe workaround to this was to use many more laser pulses and shoot over the entire sample. And what we can do with that is basically record the signal at all these different positions, as you can see here on the left-hand side for uh, the amino acid methionine. And yeah, just to highlight it, you really see this intensity variation over location. Every number here is a different spot on the sample. And for example, at spot five, we see a very high concentration, but if we go to number 11 here, there would be hardly anything. And what we do next is take the average value of these measurements and that corresponds to our average surface concentration. So to conclude my origin part of this uh, presentation, origin can very well identify minute trace levels of biomolecules. And with the correlation network analysis, uh, we have a tool that makes it possible to quickly identify the molecular composition of unknown samples, such as this permafrost sample. Now, I wanna do a little bit of a sales pitch here because we now have shown that we can analyze all kinds of biosignatures on Mars, and that is quite cool. But we can use our instrument uh, on many, many different um, environments. So we could uh, think, for example, of uh, analyzing the surface of Europa for traces of life, but we can also look at the moon to uh, investigate its mineral mineralogical composition, um, et cetera. There's plenty of opportunities. And the reason I'm saying this is because we do spend a lot of time and effort and money to develop an instrument and show that it works. But what we really want is of course, to be on a space mission. So if you know of anyone out there that is interested in developing a landed space mission and is looking for instruments to put on that space mission, please let them get in touch with us or uh, yeah, give us a call because we'd love to talk about that. So yes, just to conclude, laser-based mass spectrometry can identify biogenic elements and biomolecules, and it would make for an excellent tool on landers and rovers to detect biosignatures. And yeah, again. Talk to us if you have a space mission in mind. A couple of acknowledgements before I really wrap it up. Uh, these are some of the people that were involved in this work. A uh, special thank you to Andreas uh, Rido, of whom we see here a picture of uh, who's working on uh, one of the instruments for the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer uh, mission, which was also being developed in Bern. Uh, and yeah, Andreas has been very instrumental in developing a lot of the LMS capabilities in our group in Bern. Uh, on the funding side, special thanks to the um, Swiss National Science Foundation, which funds my work. And with that, I would be very happy to answer any questions you might be having. Thank you very much, Nils. This has been a very, uh... Uh, a very exciting talk of uh, what is possible to do. So I, 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 I suspect that everyone feels like, okay, now we have to build the next, next spacecraft and, and put your instruments on it. So yeah, I hope so, really, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that was really um, a very, a very interesting uh, overview of, of what this can do. So I was wondering if anyone has uh, some questions from the audience, you can just unmute yourself Yes. And uh, speak up. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Didier, uh, Didier Despois. So I have been working on comets. So I know a bit of the very nice uh, results from the Bern instruments in mass spectroscopy. Uh, on what you present, I have several questions. Uh, 
uh, but for example, uh, really, uh, I think it's very important to test uh, all the instruments on uh, terrestrial uh, cases. And you showed, for example, uh, the example of the permafrost. And uh, I noticed that you had a quite a low signal on glycine. Uh, could you explain why? Because I think glycine should be rather uh, abundant amino acid with respect to the other one. Is it a problem of conservation in the permafrost or something else? Yeah, that's a very good question that you bring up. Um, so for the permafrost, uh, that specific sample, it was also analyzed with um, um, LCMS, uh, liquid chromatography uh, mass spectrometry. So we know what the composition is. We know that there is glycine present in it, uh, but not a whole lot. So that's one side of the story. The other side is basically the types of molecules that our technique is sensitive to. Um, and that comes back to the fact that we are using a laser system which operates at 266 nanometers. And that is a wavelength that is very well absorbed by compounds that have uh, organic ring structures. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, tyrosine also has a ring structure. Actually on this slide, you see that in this molecule here on the top right corner. Um, but the bottom line is that those, sorry about that. But the bottom line is that those molecules we are really sensitive for, but actually glycine, we are simply not sensitive for. So that's why the okay. signal is very low. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And may I uh, ask uh, another question? Okay, go ahead. Right now. Uh, I think you, you spoke about uh, uh, putting the molecules in, uh, extracting the molecules with uh, liquid at some point. Yes. Uh, on Earth, there is, uh, for meteorites, there is, uh, there is a lot of debates on uh, this kind of techniques. Does it modify or not the composition? Could you uh, tell uh, us uh, which kind of extraction you, know, you, you plan to, to have? So the extraction is indeed not trivial. I, I can unfortunately not say a lot about the Mars context. Uh, that is actually Andreas, has read, uh, Andreas Rido's um, uh, work. Um, yeah, so I, I cannot say a lot about that, but we also focus on different objects. Um, Origin was initially developed actually for analysis of uh, material on Europa. And there we actually have a quite simple job because then the ice from Europa, we can just scoop it up and concentrate it and evaporate the water components of it. Um, yeah, a more detailed answer to that, I, I unfortunately would need to get back to you uh, via email. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what is the influence of dust winds on the quality of the line of sights for the laser beams? So for laser mass spectrometry, it will be almost negligible because um, when we use our instruments, we actually need to place our sample quite close to the, the, the time of flight instrument and the, the laser beam. So basically the entrance of the sample with respect to the sample surface, that distance is only a couple of micrometers. So this example that I gave of, um, what was it again? The uh, LIPS instruments, the uh, laser induced breakdown spectroscopy instrument. Uh, we don't use path lengths like that. We cannot do that. No, we really need to be close to our sample. And that basically means that we have a very limited influence from, um, from, from any kind of what, whatever is in the atmosphere uh, that doesn't affect our laser beam that much. OK, thank you. OK, so I was wondering if there is anyone else uh, wanting to speak up. Questions, comments? Uh, I have uh, still another question. You presented the absorption and the uh, desorption techniques. Can they be mixed? Uh, that means if you have uh, begun uh, to uh, to deal uh, to to drill or uh, to or at least to to remove some part of uh, the mineral, can you still uh, get uh, some the some of the molecules which are inside the sample uh, gently just by desorption? with a low power la laser. Yeah, oh. we, yeah we, we've been thinking a lot about that to first drill away the material and then do yeah. molecular analysis. Um, 
We never tested it because basically the, the bottom line is we have lower hanging fruits that we focus rather on. But yes, it's it's something we are very keen to inter- to to investigate. But it's it's not straightforward at all, unfortunately. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So anyone else who wants to uh, to speak up? No, I see no more questions. Uh, perhaps so, a, I... a quick question, uh, Timia. Yeah, Alain? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, Alain. Alain Baudry here. Um, I come back to your permafrost uh, sample. I didn't see, I think, uh, much uh, water uh, signature. Uh, do you have an explanation to that? Um, so actually, um... Going back to that spectrum, uh, the interesting slash surprising thing about it is that we actually do see a little bit of a water signature. Ah, okay. Um, let me quickly go back there. Yes, here. Yeah, we do see one of the mass. Uh, uh, let me see if this is 18 or 19. Yeah, I think 18. But yes, this mass we identify as water. Um, but normally, under normal conditions, we basically have a solution of organic material in water, but the water is evaporated. So many of our more controlled experiments, there is no signature at all of water because it is evaporated. There's nothing left. But in this case, we still see it. And we basically think that this is um, hydrates in soil particles that still remain in a solid phase on the surface. Um, and that's why we see them here. But in general, we, we are actually not expecting to see that much uh, water signatures. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I had a very quick question on your correlation network analysis. So I, I was wondering, I mean, this is just a technique, right? How you interpret and how you, how you analyze this um, this, this data set that you obtained. So I was wondering how much a priori knowledge on the content you have to assume to get these nice results, or can it be used in a completely uh, kind of unbiased way without having any strong assumptions in, in, as an initial uh, guess? How does yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, it, it really depends on the environment. So if I, for example, draw the comparison with uh, the Rosetta mission, uh, where we also used mass spectrometry, but basically on an unknown sample, it is still a relatively easy task uh, because we are dealing there mostly with simple molecules such as water, um, a bit of CO, um, methanol, those kind of molecules. And then, um, yeah, coming from that concept, it's relatively easy to identify this. But indeed, we will have definitely our work cut out for these organic molecules because yeah we i'm now demonstrating how this works with amino acids uh, but there is a massive amount of biomolecules out there and an even larger amount of non-biological molecules and and they could all have overlapping mass signatures so we definitely need to make some assumptions about what can be present and we might also still need to look more into techniques to filter and, and weed out the various uh, components uh, and signatures. Um, yeah, to, to make that further clear, for example, um, chromatography uh, works on the basis of you can select amino acids or you can select limit, lipids as one example, but you cannot really do both uh, in an instrument. So maybe we need to do something along those lines as well, where we come up with a mechanism to only select the amino acids and then analyze with origin or only select lipids and then analyze those with origin, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so is there is there anyone else wanting to speak up? Uh, I have a last uh, question. Uh, it's very important for mass spectroscopy to have a high uh, mass resolution. How does it compare to Rosina, for example? Oh, um, ooh, that's a good question because now I need to uh, <laughs> remember what the values are for Rosina. So what we have is a mass resolution that goes up to a thousand. For organic molecules, we are usually dealing with 800 to a thousand. Um, if we are working in ablation mode with the LMS instruments, then we usually have between 400 and 800, um, which is at least comparable with the okay. Rosetta okay. instruments. Um, but the exact values of the Rosetta instruments. No, I, I wanted to know yeah. if it was at least that good, and that's. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, all right. 
So I think that if there are no further questions, I have to make an announcement that I should have done in the beginning, but I wrote it in the chat. So that those who are still online, we have recorded this meeting. And um, if, 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 you, if you are opposing to it, then just please contact me. We are going to cut the content anyhow, um, as agreed with our speaker today. So with all this, I, I would like to thank very much to you, Nils, that you have accepted to give us this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, many new things, at least for me. Um, and also thanks to, to everyone who assisted and who participated. And I think that with this one, we can close the seminar for today. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>